Pluto. For nearly a century, it was known as the solar system's ninth planet. And then, amid much public outcry, the distant, frozen world was stripped of its title, relegated to the status of mere dwarf planet. But around the same time Pluto lost its planetary status, interest in it exploded as NASA's New Horizons mission was launched to the dwarf planet and then beamed back high-resolution images that completely upended everything scientists thought they knew about it. It turned out Pluto has huge ice volcanoes stretching kilometres into the sky and giant spikes of frozen methane taller than skyscrapers. Because of its distance, studying Pluto is hard. Until scientists send another spacecraft there, one of the best ways to study it is when it undergoes a rare event called a stellar occultation, when the dwarf planet passes directly in front of a star. In a few days' time, a stellar occultation of Pluto will occur, and for this event, the very best place to study it from is near the outback town of Catherine in the Northern Territory in Australia. And that's where I'm heading to meet up with a big team of scientists who have travelled from around the world to take advantage of the rare event. Catherine is the perfect place to study the event from because as Pluto passes in front of the star, it casts a shadow on the Earth. And to get the most information from it, you want to be right in the middle of that shadow. And according to some very detailed calculations, that centre should be somewhere around here. The sun is setting over the outback town of Catherine and a cluster of astronomers are gathering. The focus is on getting the data. And quickly getting to work. Among this lot are some of the world's foremost experts on Pluto. It's just a lot easier to move that without the telescope. Ooh, that looks nice. And this is where the magic happens. As well as a ragtag team of students and amateur astronomers. Uh, connect the camera. I have been doing occultations for a little bit over a year now. Just send me an email that NASA is coming to NT, so I was really excited. We have a mirror. The aim is to examine the atmosphere and even peer below the surface of a distant and frozen world. Basically, we're getting the weather report on Pluto. What's the pressure and temperature in the atmosphere? Are there any winds? That's Leslie Young. She's come from Boulder, Colorado, and is leading the mission. Pluto is the brightest and most easily studied of the third zone of the solar system. Pluto, the former planet, is the best known member of what's called the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is made up of rock, ice and dust that's left over from when the solar system formed. It's like the fossilised remains of the early solar system. Astronomers hope by better understanding the Kuiper Belt, Pluto and its buddies, they can better understand how our solar system formed. We don't know exactly how the giant planets migrated, but the signature of how the early solar system formed and evolved is hidden in the third zone of the solar system. Only one spacecraft has ever visited Pluto, NASA's New Horizons, which zoomed past the dwarf planet in 2015, and Professor Young was at the helm. This kind of stellar occultation probes a part of the atmosphere that even New Horizons couldn't detect. These 40 or so astronomers have come from universities, space agencies and amateur observatories around the world with a dozen 40 centimetre telescopes shipped in from the US and converged here in Catherine, all to observe a rare event that will last just a few minutes. The astronomers here are known as shadow tracers, all trying to catch the shadow of Pluto as it moves across the Earth. You can only see that from what's called the shadow path, which is only as large as Pluto itself. So there's a 2,000 kilometer path. If you're in that path, you can see Pluto 
block out the star. It'll give the scientists a rare opportunity to study the dwarf planet's normally invisible atmosphere. As it blocks out the star, the starlight will shine through Pluto's atmosphere. And as it does that, the starlight will get bent and coloured. Exactly how it's bent and how it's coloured will reveal for the scientists the temperature of the atmosphere at different altitudes, as well as its density. It'll essentially give the scientists a weather report for Pluto, revealing a bit more about what it would be like to stand on the dwarf planet. If you're right in the very centre of the shadow, within a couple hundred kilometres of that shadow, that's where you might see some extra stuff. If the scientists' calculations are right and one of the telescopes is in exactly the right spot, it will see the star start to dim as Pluto passes in front of it. And then, right when it's almost completely blocked out, it should flash very brightly as Pluto's atmosphere focuses the starlight on that location. The central flash gives astronomers crucial information about the lowest depths of the atmosphere and maybe even what lies beneath Pluto's frozen surface. How are you? We're bringing a lot of telescopes uh, mainly because we're hoping to get one of the telescopes in the very centre of the shadow, and we don't know exactly where that is. You're getting inside the circle just a touch, but still. We hope that one of them will get right exactly in the centre of the shadow, but even if we don't, we have a lot of glass very close to the centre, and if we add that all up, it's as if we had observatory quality uh, telescope here at Catherine Royal Campus. Tonight was one of several well-orchestrated practice runs ahead of the real deal in a couple of days when Pluto moves in to block out the star. When that happens, these 12 telescopes will fan out to 11 different locations and all point towards the same thing. After three practice runs, it's time. OK, folks, it's showtime. All the prep's done. You're all practiced up. You know what you're doing, we hope. <laughs> These sorts of observations come down to a couple of things, planning and logistics, and the other side of it is weather. I can control the planning and logistics, but we have no control over the weather. Catherine rarely sees much cloud in the dry season, but the day of the observation, it's so cloudy, it makes the local news. Dark clouds blanketed the town this morning with temperatures expected to reach 35 and 36 degrees over the next couple of days. At this point, all we have to do is go out to our sites. We've already practiced. We know what we're doing. Go out there at the appointed 10 minutes, take data on Pluto and the star, and hope the clouds are, will part at the right time, and we get the occultation that we came halfway around the world to see. It doesn't have to be good weather all night long. It just has to be good weather at quarter of two in the morning on June 2nd. I wish we uh, had better weather prospects, but it is what it is, and do your best, and uh, good luck. And with that, the team hit the road. After the practice they've had, setting up the telescopes is a breeze. You're getting inside the circle just a touch, but still. Oh, oh. Right. Yep, now you're at eight. Distributed across the region, the telescope's first job is pointing at the right part of the sky, which some teams nail. Yes! This moment you have to bleep out. We're on the field, bitches. So, <laughs> well, it's all right. We've loved our uh, high five. Fighting the clouds to find the right star is a challenge for some of the teams. It's midnight here in Catherine and we're less than two hours from the occultation. The sky is cloudy, which is really unusual for this part of the world. And if it stays that way, the whole mission could be a bust. But everyone's getting ready just the same and hoping that the clouds part for just a few minutes at the right moment. And then, with almost no time to spare, the heavens are revealed. An hour ago, it didn't look good. Right now, it's a spectacular night as you could hope for. And with a perfect sky, the teams knuckle down. And we're going to set our CCD temperature 
zero. When the moment arrives, all they can do is hit record on their laptops and wait. Five, four, three, two, one, go. All right, get started. <laughs> Watching an occultation is a little strange because you don't want to touch anything. You are frozen. Don't be tempted to tweak just a little something. So you have to be very still and at the same time you're watching to see, can you see by eye, did you get what you came for? And then it starts to happen. The star fades. So the central flash should happen in a minute and a half. In a way, it's a lot of effort for three minutes, but you're seeing the whole atmosphere backlit by a star. It's really a unique kind of incredible data set. And perhaps against all the odds, they get what they came for. Yay! Oh my God! That was, wow. that was spectacular. Oh, that was brighter. Yeah, that was... So that was... <laughs> I think we have to get Simon a deep fried Twinkie. <laughs> My application life is complete. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, you should retire. I'm, I'm going home. You know, it's too early to, to measure this, but qualitatively speaking, this has to be the brightest one that anyone's seen. We're learning not just about Pluto's atmosphere, but also about its subsurface. And maybe that'll tell us what the subsurface on other bodies in the third zone are like also. I think we're gonna learn a whole bunch about a planet that's on the other side of the solar system. It'll be weeks or maybe even months before the scientists can extract detailed new information from this occultation. But for now, this grainy image of a tiny world passing an even more distant star is promising a new understanding about the solar system we call home.